I am here with Maya Rocky Moore, uh, who is the executive director of Global Policy Solutions. And uh, you've been a leader in uh, talking about the economic conditions of uh, all people in America, uh, but particularly people in color, people of color. And I wanted to uh, talk to you very briefly about uh, particularly the agenda for what you call Beyond Ferguson. Right. Um, underneath the what we saw in Ferguson, Missouri, uh, the the reaction to the uh, to the death of Michael Brown, uh, you've been arguing that there is a serious economic crisis that exists not just in Ferguson but in communities across America. Right. the The hidden story is that our nation has a racial wealth gap. Uh, there's a wealth gap and there's a racial income gap. We typically talk about the gender income gap, but the uh, racial income gap is just as significant. And the wealth gap is actually astonishing. Uh, full 50 years after the Civil Rights Act of 1964, uh, for every dollar, one dollar that whites own, uh, African Americans only own six cents and Latinos only own seven cents. So many of our communities are desperate. Uh, while the Civil Rights Act uh, and the Civil Rights Movement did result in um, more African Americans moving into the middle class, uh, the effects of uh, the housing crisis and the Great Recession uh, have actually um, stopped that progress uh, and uh, have reversed it. And, and we're seeing a desperate situation in many communities across the country, uh, particularly for African Americans. Uh, it's interesting you say that because we've seen uh, report after report about the general decline of the middle class uh, that has fallen behind in the last uh, two decades. And you said that that has been exacerbated in the African American community. It has been. Um, when you look at, for those African Americans who have assets, because remember African Americans and Latinos, a third uh, of both communities have zero assets or negative assets, meaning that they're in debt. Uh, and so um, for those that do have it, um, it, it was tied up into their homes. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? You know, with the subprime mortgage uh, debacle, uh, many of these families were actually targeted uh, for loans that were actually unsustainable. Uh, these subprime loans that were exploding, that were unsustainable in terms of payments, had balloon payments, etc. Uh, and so what you saw was a dramatic loss of wealth uh, across communities of color, by the way. Um, between 2005 and 2010, uh, African Americans, Latinos, and Asian Americans all collectively lost more than half of their net worth, mm -hmm. uh, compared to only 16% uh, loss for, for white families. Uh, and so that shows the effects uh, of the housing subprime targeting uh, crisis. It also shows the effects of uh, unemployment uh, that was wrought by the Great Recession, particularly in African American communities. And unemployment continues in the African American community, continues to run roughly double uh, the white unemployment rate generally. Always. But Always. in communities like Ferguson, I've seen numbers that were extraordinary. That's right. Uh, 30, 40 percent. Yeah, you have uh, communities that are basically um, on the margins of the local economy. Uh, it is where the people have been actually segregated by race and class. Uh, and these people are often isolated from job opportunities. Uh, they are caught in a cycle uh, of involvement with the criminal justice system. And we've learned, I think Ferguson has unveiled for us why that's the case. Mm -hmm. uh, because law enforcement officials have become revenue generating arms of the state. Yeah. Uh, and they have uh, targeted these uh, low income populations uh, for misdemeanors and tickets that actually get them involved in the criminal justice system in a way that's a never ending spiral downward. Uh, sure, it ends up generating revenue for the state, but it also criminalizes and permanently excludes these populations from ever getting a foothold in the economy. Let's talk about how we fix all of this. Um, Congress, well, let's talk about how we fix this. In an ideal world, what would we be doing in an ideal political climate? 
So in an ideal political climate, first of all, policymakers and advocates would be free to talk about race as, as if as they are as when they talk about gender. I mean, it's, you know, race and ethnicity actually explain quite a bit uh, in terms of the disparities that we're actually seeing. And when we talk about class without talking about race and gender, we do ourselves a disservice because we ignore a very real history in this country that have de that has deliberately uh, marginalized uh, families of color. Uh, and when we don't uh, explicitly address that, then we're saying that that's okay. The counter argument has been that if we just simply focus on class, if we focus on individual disadvantage rather than talk about race as a, as a construct, that if we just talk about individual situations or specific uh, community in the geographical sense situations, that we can begin to solve this, that we really don't have to talk about race. Tell that to women. You think women would buy that argument? They're not buying it. And that's why we have a specific economic agenda that's focused on closing the gender uh, income gap, you know? And so we need to have that kind of specificity when it comes to race and ethnicity. Uh, because the fact of the matter is the disparities are real. And by not acknowledging it, you just perpetuate it. Uh, and so what we call for is targeted universalism strategies. strategies. Basically, there are universal policies that we can all embrace by class, sure, fine. But we need targeted strategies to get to those communities that have been left out of the mainstream economy for so long. And that means that we have to look at uh, policies that actually disproportionately affect black and brown people. There were programs in the 1970s, such as the, the old CETA program. The, it was the jobs program that was targeted at uh, low-income communities and people of color. It disappeared in the Reagan era. Uh, is that the kind of thing you're talking about bringing back? I think there are policies that are targeted job strategies is absolutely something that's needed. We need targeted education strategies. It is a crime uh, that in the 21st century we allow school districts to be financed by the relative wealth of the surrounding neighborhood. We already, I already told you uh, that the surrounding neighborhoods are actually economically segregated. That means that certain schools are uh, under-resourced because their um, neighborhoods aren't able to generate the sufficient revenues in order to make sure uh, that the kids that go to those schools are sufficiently educated. Uh, and, and, and frankly, the federal uh, overlay uh, of, you know, of resources is not enough. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's a lot that we can do with targeted strategies that look at everything from busting segregation in itself. I mean, we've abandoned the integration conversation as a nation. Uh, but, you know, the fact of the matter is that new research actually shows uh, that where you actually have uh, that income and racial segregation, it depresses economic mobility, not just for uh, the segregated low income or racial populations, but for everybody in the region. And so if we're talking about lifting all boats, that means that we need to be looking at how do we break uh, this cycle of segregation and exclusion that actually is is of uh, is of a negative uh, has a negative impact on all of us, and frankly, we're going to have to do that as a nation uh, because the nation's demographics are changing. You know, I don't need to tell you that. Right. Finally, it occurs to me that uh, the nation is entering into something called uh, Freedom Sunday, and uh, this is. Uh, part of the focus is mobilizing people to get out to vote. Right. Um, how important is that uh, to for, for African Americans, particularly this election? Is it possible, uh, with people being as demoralized as they are about the political process, uh, is mobilizing the gout to vote in this election going to make that much of a difference? So it's only as important as it is connected to a policy strategy. See, if you're mobilizing people to get out the vote and then they re-elect people who then have an agenda that does not recognize the elements that we've just discussed, then of course you're going to get the same results. And what is the, is the definition of doing the same thing over and over again and getting the same result? That's the definition of insanity. Uh, and, and the fact of the matter is, is that we need policymakers, not just the Congressional Black Caucus, not just the Congressional Hispanic Caucus. We need white policymakers uh, who are progressive, who are Democrats, I mean, we, we even need Republicans. 
uh, to recognize uh, that you know you've got to do your policy making differently to recognize the need uh, to focus on uh, vulnerable populations and develop solutions that actually help lift these peoples uh, and uh, lift their economic status and provide economic security for all. And, and to the extent that you have people getting out the vote over and over again for people who are not responsive on the policy side, you will get that level of frustration uh, and the sense of that, that none of this matters. Uh, and then at, at some point there's a diminishing return. So I would argue that you know you can't have a political turnout disconnected from the policy arena. So we've got a lot of work to do. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you.